Welcome to Immunology 5 in our series of talking about the immune system, which could go on for, oh, days and days. I bet you we could make Immunology 100 if we wanted to, but at an introductory level, we can't go that far. This lesson is titled Leukodiapedesis. That's a great term. Leuco refers to leukocytes, which are, you know, white blood cells, right? And diapedesis is where they actually squeeze through capillary walls. Okay? So, of course, I've got some beautiful pictures that people have made. I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. In fact, uh, maybe not cover that up. Let's see. Oh, right there. Okay. Well, let me orientate you here. Let me get this over there so I have a little more room. The bigger, the better, depending on how it shows up on your screen. Let me orientate you. The cells that, oops, sorry. Let's see, I'm saying sorry because my thing just did something. Okay, this line of cells going off to the left from my blue line. Those are endothelial cells that make up a capillary. So I got to orientate you here. So above that is the lumen of the capillary. Okay, so then it's not in the drawing, but someplace up here there'd be a line of cells to make the other wall. We're looking at a side view of a capillary. And then down here is interstitial space. And there would be some cells down here too. They just chose not to uh, show any cells, but let me do some cells. There's a cell there. These cells would have a nucleus. There's a cell here, right? And the space between the cells is called interstitial space. That's an oblong cell. Okay, so now I've got you orientated. We've got the lumen of the capillary. I'm back up here. I am going to use red. I want to look at this cell right here below my red <clears throat> line. We're going to call that a neutrophil that's going through the capillary. Now capillary blood flow is really slow. There's a lot of time for things to happen in the capillary. That's the whole kicker. This neutrophil you'll see is tied to the wall by molecules. I'm not going to name them. We're not going to be responsible for the names. There's too many names. The thing is, once a neutrophil attaches to some of these molecules, then it tends to roll like this next one is doing. And sooner or later, it will do this. It will squeeze through the endothelial cells. And that's called diapedesis up here, okay? There might be called tight binding later. There's rolling adhesion. There's definitely adhesion, adhesion between the molecules. And then this migration, I'm up here. Uh, don't want to cover up migration. Migration. That's when this cell down here, I'm in the lower right, goes someplace. It might be attracted, like, say, down here, okay? Of course, I've got another good picture of that and the more pictures you look at the more you can understand this whole thing this is somebody else's interpretation of the exact same thing as the last uh illustration we got the i'm over here in the far left now with a red laser pointer blood vessel lumen there's a, these this drawing doesn't show those molecules but it, it does if the molecules don't come up on this these endothelial cells, these neutrophils, we'll call them, will not stop. So there's got to be a reason for this stopping and rolling. The point is, every artist has different depictions. This is the transmigration. That might be another name for diapedesis. There's the term endothelial cell. That's the cells that make up the walls of capillaries. And then this is the migration, right? It's going to be attracted to the bacteria. 
And if it's a neutrophil, it's a very famous cell for phagocytosis. When a cell is attracted to some place for good reason, it's called chemotaxis, usually chemicals. It sniffs, it smells chemicals, you know, it doesn't have a nose, but quote unquote smells chemicals and travels in the direction of higher and higher concentrations of those chemicals. That's called positive chemotaxis. And then just so you understand, down here where I'm circling my laser pointer, that's interstitial tissue, right? They said tissue, but it's interstitial tissue because then we could draw other cells here. Uh, you know what? I don't want to use red because you might think those are red blood cells. So here's cells. Now here's the thing before I leave this slide. I've lost track of my pointer here. Sorry. There it is. Okay. Neutrophils do this, but you know that red blood cells cannot do that. So I'm going to draw some red blood cells in here. Notice I don't put a nucleus, right? They don't have a nucleus. Red blood cells cannot undergo diapodesis. You have to have a brain to undergo diapodesis, and the brain is the nucleus. And red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Okay, another illustration, because every illustration has something to say. You can't just look at one. That's why I am basically toss textbooks away forever, because I want to look at a lot of images, a lot of interpretations of this process. Now look at this one. We're going to do panel A up on top. This is when a cell goes from the interstitial space, also called the interstitium, into the lumen of the capillary. Intrathesation. Okay? Got some very similar things. You can say when it goes through the wall, it's diapodesis. You can read the labeling. B is extravasation. So that's kind of like that rolling adhesion and then migrating the cell into the interstitial space, right? So those are two great terms antonyms of each other, of course. C and D are less important. If a white blood cell, let's say a neutrophil, goes between two endothelial cells, right between them, then it's called paracellular diapodesis. If the neutrophil goes through a pore in the endothelial cell, then it's called transcellular, trans across the cell. Not as important as A and B above. And surprise! another figure showing the same thing but it adds a little thing about oh when you step on a nail or get poked with barbed wire if you're fixing fence out on the range montana or north dakota or minnesota like i've done and you do this there's always bacteria and there's tissue damage and lo and behold look at the diameter of the blood vessels here versus the next panel there's vasodilation, and then the blood vessels, the capillaries in, in this point, are more leaky, okay? And there's more blood coming to this area. The tissue probably looks red, right? Tissue that's irritated tends to be red appearance. Why? Because there's more blood coming to that area. Then on the bottom, it just shows a lateral view of a neutrophil. Notice how I've said neutrophils a lot. They're always calling them phagocytes, but there is no such cell as a phagocyte. There's phagocytic cells. And the two most famous ones in our pets are neutrophils, which I've been harping on, haven't I? And then phagocytes, uh, not phagocytes, macrophages. The, the term, <laughs> it's got me saying phagocytes. Phagocytes are any cell that eats something. I want to be particular. I want to say neutrophils and macrophages. But we get into the tissue, and then those cells are phagocytic, and lo and behold, they're going to fight the bacteria that came in when we got our puncture wound. Now, I just want to digress a little bit. In the, uh, oh, in the early immunology uh, presentations, either one or two, we talked about cells of the immune system. And I just want to reiterate that and show you this table that has a nice little numbers for the canine, the dog, the cat, and the human. And I want to talk about the neutrophils, right? Neutrophils. 
there are relatively a lot of neutrophils because look at here's the white blood cell count that means all white blood cells and neutrophils are a subset but you know look at they make up about half of all the white blood cells then you've got lymphocytes you know there's b and t monocytes become macrophages and then you got eosinophils and basophils and of course you know platelets are not white blood cells right platelets are thrombocytes they're involved with blood clotting uh, and there's even red blood cell count up here and here's hematocrit if you remember our hematocrit value we were just going to do 45 percent as a convention but look at there's quite a range like look at cats 30 to 50 wow i didn't realize it was quite that wide a range anyway a lot of neutrophils they're very famous they're phagocytic but i should say they're also short-lived now i found this little uh, table or not table illustration slide that talks about the functions of white blood cells when we're talking about the action of diapedesis and so forth so it's got and of course you can read this but leukocytes and read neutrophils and then monocytes are the precursor for macrophages so you could read macrophages in here they're mobile they move around they're the most mobile they're capable of diapedesis squeeze between the cells and sometimes through the cells if there's a pore into tissue space which we have been calling interstitial space exhibits chemotaxis because that way it's attracted to chemicals in the damaged tissue it's like sniffing around if it goes one direction now i'm talking about a neutrophil and the chemical smell gets less it's going to move in a different direction and it's going to go up to the higher and higher smell it's like us in a room we could find the bottle of perfume broken on the floor couldn't we by smelling around it's just like that that's called positive chemotaxis if you ever have a case where a cell is repelled by a strong chemical presence and it seeks, you know, away from that point, then that's called negative chemotaxis. And then here's maybe the, one of the most important points. When all those neutrophils undergo diapedesis and come into a tissue, that's pus. Pus is formed when we have the bacteria that are being phagocytized, but dead tissue, necrotic tissue, you could say, and then the dead neutrophils. And pus tends to be white on the order of some kind of color white because neutrophils are white. So make that point. Pus, presence of a lot of neutrophils and necrotic tissue. And then one of our next things we're going to talk about is animals that can't do this. There's something wrong, and it's genetic, that their neutrophils can't come into the interstitial space, and they don't really form pus very well, and they don't fight bacteria very well. So now we're going to talk about a condition in dogs that has the acronym CLAD, CLAD. CLAD stands for canine leukocyte adhesion deficiency well lo and behold in dogs that have this condition it's genetic by the way and we'll show you how that works they're not they don't have the right molecules on their neutrophils okay so then when those adhesion molecules that pop up on the endothelial cells reach out into the lumen there's not a corresponding molecule on the neutrophil to stop and roll. If you remember, you can go back to those first four illustrations. They've got to touch with molecules. They got to, they're already moving slow, but then there's got to be adhesion molecules. And if they're deficient, then those neutrophils will not get into tissue. Now, this uh, little page I got from some genetic company really says a lot of good stuff. And I'm going to enlarge it bigger to look at the top. And lo and behold, I mean, I'm going to like, you could pause it to read it. Let's put it that way. I'm going to enlarge it, pause, read it. Basically, it's Irish setters that are affected by this. Okay, you can read it. I'm going to go down to the genetics. 
and I'm going to do this and talk a little bit about it. It's basically autosomal recessive. Now what that means is it's like, well, let's look at the table here. If you have a large C and a large L and another copy of that gene at a locus, there's really like two alleles can be there, right? These are called alleles, the CL, CL, large. If they're both present in the homozygous state, that would be homozygous, then the, this animal, this genetic, the animal, I should say, would have clad, homozygous for clad, okay? So if the dog has two copies of this mutant gene, it's going to display symptoms with this disorder. And it's always going to pass along one copy, one allele to offspring, okay? Now an animal, and this is the only animal that will show the disease affected, it's got clad. If it's got one copy of CL, but then the N in this display, I'm not sure if that's the convention, but it doesn't matter. This animal is a carrier, but it's not affected. It doesn't show clad because the only animal that shows clad is CL, CL, but it can give CL to its offspring. Okay. Then if an animal has little n, little n, it's clear and it's not a carrier at all because it only will give its offspring N. So now what I want to show you is for an autosomal recessive trait, we're looking up here, that means it's not on the sex chromosomes. Autosomal recessive trait, let me take you through this. Uh, and I'll get rid of that and make this larger. And of course you can pause this and look at it. I'll get you started. If the sire, that's the dad, has little n and little n, if the mom has little n, little n, and they're bred and they're all their offspring will have little n, little n, that's a red pointer, dis laser, red laser disappearing perfectly in the red. Anyway, there's no carriers and those animals are not affected. Now, if you have one, the sire's clear, and then the mom has, you know, CL and then N, well, no one's going to have the, no one's in the offspring are not going to show clad because you've got 50% that are totally clear. That would be little n, little n. And then 50% of the offspring from this mating, let's say, then are large CL, little n. There's carriers there, but no one's affected. Now, if you've got somebody that's clear, remember that's little n, little n, and somebody affected, Right here, that's a lot CL, CL. So all the offspring are carriers, but no one has the disease um, of the offspring. Look at the dam is affected, right? Affected means they have clad. Affected means CL, CL. Carrier would be CL, little n, and clear is little n, little n. Well, no one has it over here. You can go through that thing, digest it. And finally, I just want to say, uh, tell you what other animals are affected by leukocyte adhesion deficiency. In the humans, it's called LAD, L-A-D, okay? So you can read this. It's rare. It's uh, present at birth because it's your genes. You're born with it. Uh, you fail to express a surface molecule, so then those white blood cells cannot adhere. Some of the symptoms of that person Respiratory tract infection, frequent. Otitis media, that means the middle ear is inflamed. Primary and permanent tooth affected. Teeth maybe, I should say. Teeth affected. So there's early teeth loss, early tooth loss. So, and then there's one other animal that's pretty well known, and that's cattle, and that's called BLAD, B-L-A-D. Maybe I'll type it out here for you get my pointer here just so you know and it actually did cause quite devastation in the dairy industry if you want to look it up look up dairy cattle bland there was a bull that uh, spread it through a lot of offspring and finally I just want to share 
with you where those illustrations come from. Came from, I probably should say. Take care.